You're listening to the best of the Martha Zoller Show. You can hear the show live Monday through Friday from 9 to 11 on AM 550 and FM 102.9 WDUN and streaming at accesswdun.com. You can find all things Martha Zoller at marthazoller.com. My first guest is Representative Mike Collins, and he has uh, very interestingly, I don't think this was intentional, although I've always known Mike has had a good sense of humor. I like to say that um, I have, you know, understood Mike Collins and had him on the program long before all these other people have discovered him. He was featured on the Ruthless podcast, which is a whole bunch of Washington insiders that now do a very funny podcast because if you don't laugh you're going to cry with what's going on in the world you've got to be funny about it he's got a great uh post on his twitter feed calling himself the memer in in memer of congress uh he's done a lot of funny things i heard his communications director went on her honeymoon and so that unleashed this guy during this period of time so mike collins is here with me today we got some serious stuff to talk about but Mike, if you don't laugh, you're going to cry. Uh, good morning, Martha. <laughs> yeah, you know you're exactly right. It's it's people have been asking us about it, and and actually the conference has really been laughing about it, and and a lot to the point where a lot of them keep they're they're submitting stuff to us. Hey, throw this one up on the wall and see what it does. Uh, but uh, but you're exactly right. We have got serious things going on, not just here in our conference, not just here in the country, but around the world. But occasionally, you know, a good little uh, levity is good. Uh, you know, Southerners are known for humility, for humor, uh, especially in hard times. And, and you know, and I like, kind of liken it to that. We just, uh, you know, you even go to church, good Southern Baptist preacher, throw a joke out there every week. Well, and you put out, you know, there was some talk about you running for speaker, and you put out a list of your demands if you ran for speaker, <laughs> you know, and a few of them were very, very funny, you know, but some of them were serious and important, like if you're not getting certain things done, you you stay in, you don't, you don't yeah. take a recess. Uh, I would say you guys shouldn't be getting paid right now, mm-hmm. you know, I'm sorry, that's not very funny, but... That's probably what should happen. But tell me how that whole list came about. Well, it, that list came about, and, and, and some of it, my staff just hears me talking about things. And, of course, the 18 wheels, you know, from the 18 <laughs> wheelers. I'm trucking, so that was that I was loved kind that. Of an obvious one and now. you know what? Those guys and, on Ruthless Podcast didn't get that. But I, <laughs> I have texted them since and said, you know, yeah. he runs a transport company. Ah, now they yeah, understand. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, but the working longer hours than, than the UAW, yeah, it's a, it's funny. But, but you know that I think we've even talked about that. How many times have I said, why are we flying in on Monday afternoon to have a vote, a suspension vote on naming a post office Monday at six o'clock at night? We yes. should be like every other American. Get up here on Sunday night, be ready to go to work at seven a.m. on the Monday on Monday morning, and then work throughout the day into the night if 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 need be. Look, I mean, and, we're, and you're we've got a leadership position. And we've gotten in a place where I understand what happened about 20 years ago. And I think you're, when your father was in Congress, he might have been a part of this movement where there was more of a focus on getting home on the weekends and knowing what constituents do. And so fewer and fewer members of Congress stayed or, or moved their families up, which I get and I understand, but also that the relationships suffered because of that. The relationships yeah, that well, people had to be able to get things done suffered. So how do we find the balance there? Well, when things are due, especially like appropriation bills, this and, and in the springtime, uh, we should be focused on, on getting that work done. And then maybe towards the end of that, once you get those done, then yes, you can get out. I, I tell you what, Martha. This is what I honestly believe, that, that people will, will reward you for your work. When yes. they see what you're up here doing, what you're trying to accomplish, they, they know you're working, and, and they know that, that, that they will support you with that. Uh, this, this notion that we have to, to go home, if, we, if we're up here on Monday, we have to go home on Thursday, or we come in on Tuesday, we go home on Friday morning, that just doesn't get the work done. No, it doesn't. You know, I, I've it been doesn't. in the private sector for 34 years. You cannot operate a business, and this is a huge business up here. 
It's a huge. Uh, you, you it's probably the biggest, truck, probably the biggest business in the world. Now, let's yeah. talk a little bit about what's happening today. Um, I, I made a joke about they got one of the names right, Mike Johnson, um, <laughs> and I don't really know him. Okay, I don't. I haven't really crossed yeah. paths with him. So, what should we know about Mike Johnson? Are you supporting him? Yeah, I'm supporting him. I, uh, I supported him uh, when he was running um, in that conference. Uh, he's a great family man, good Christian man, solid, solid conservative. You know, he's part of this young, younger people. I think you and I have talked about it before as well. I'm not looking for somebody that's been up here for decades. We need new blood, new ideas, someone that really wants to run this place in a different atmosphere and in a, in a different route to where we put this thing up like a business and run it more like that. This guy is, is the vice chair of our conference. He was chairman of the Republican Study Committee right after he got here. He's not been here for 10 years. So it, it, it meets all of the criteria that I, that I was looking for, and his voting right record matches up well with mine. So I'm, I'm happy uh, because I, I was not supporting Tom Emmer. Uh, when he when he got the, nom- the, the nod yesterday, I just couldn't do it. Uh, we went from from Jordan, who was great conservative, to probably the most moderate leader that we have in our so, conference. And it just, so uh, obviously didn't you're happen. you're a businessman. You've got to compromise. You know the numbers. We got four members yeah. of, in the House. We got. Um, we're behind a seat in the Senate. We got a Democratic president. Do you think Mike Johnson can? One, make the appropriate kind of compromises that will need to be made with the kind of numbers you're being faced with. And will he be able to communicate with the conference, the caucus, so that he can keep them together? Yeah, I think I think it goes back to to to, to rule Matt Collins rule number one. They've got to like you and they got to trust you. You know, and, and I think that's what Mike Johnson is bringing to the table most of all. The, the conference trust him. Uh, they know he's conservative. They, they and, and the thing about that is, you can take that message when you got somebody that wholeheartedly believes in it, and they can take that message to America and they can sell that message and tell the American people which way we're going, why we're going there, and when we're going to do that. And that's what people are looking for. They're looking for 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 goals. They're looking for places to go and what we're going to do. And uh, and he can bring all of that to the table. You know, you did vote to support leaving Speaker McCarthy in. And, um, and you know, obviously, the, you're a guy, and if I'm characterizing you wrong, just tell me, that you accepted that you lost that vote, and so you've been trying to get the best person in there. Um, Kevin McCarthy has stayed very engaged, and I like that. I like the fact that he's not taking his ball and going home, that he is still fighting no, no, for the hasn't. same things that he was fighting for before. How is the mood up there right now? Uh, it's strained. It has been strained. I think that's been obvious just by the amount of, of uh, votes that we've taken, people that we've put up that haven't gotten through. Um, but uh, but you're right, McCarthy. In my opinion, it was the wrong time to be litigating why we didn't have our appropriation bills done. Right. Wrong time. Yeah. Uh, you know, we had, we had 70% of them passed. If we had not vacated the chair with eight people on our side and 208 on the other side, then we would have 90% of our appropriations done today. Yeah. We had them, we, had, we, we finally had a schedule and we hired, we had them all lined up, ready to go. We've got two that are still in subcommittee, but they would probably already have been out of subcommittee by now because we've had to stop committees to go in and have conference to vote on new nominees. So, you know, it, it was just, uh, it was bad timing, but you can't go back and take it back. Now. You can't change the past, right? You can't change no, the past. No. So I know I got short time with you, but I want to ask you, are you going to be in Miami with the Ruthless Podcast guys for the next debate? <laughs> well, we're, we're going to go pay them a visit while they're here in town today. We're going, <laughs> we're, we're going to see them this morning. Well, you go tell tell them I said hi. I've worked with different I'll ones of them over the years, and um, I'm looking forward. I mean, I love that podcast. It's not something I can play here because they use some colorful language at times, but <laughs> it's funny. It's it's hard pressing, and it gets to the core of it. And I think we need more of that, not less of that. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm just uh, I'm hopeful for today, 
And good Lord willing, we're going to get back to doing the work that the American people sent us up here and uh, get this place back on track because uh, we are we have wasted a lot of time. And you can't get that back either. <laughs> no, no. Mike Collins, uh, thank you so much, and I can't wait to see what you're going to be posting next. <laughs> Thank you, Martha. It's local radio, and that's why you're listening. It's the Martha Zoller Show on AM 550 and FM 102.9 WDUN. It is the Martha Zoller Show, and I am here with Rod Huey. Rod, how you doing? Good morning. I almost called you Rod Stewart, the singer. (laughs) I don't know why I did that. that bank account. That's right. That's like, that's right. (laughs) Absolutely. Uh, But it's a big day, okay? We've got a new Speaker of the House. I think most people didn't see it coming, and I kind of like it. So we're going to talk to Congressman Andrew Clyde. He was in the room, and uh, we're going to hear from him this morning. Hey, Andrew, how are you? Well, good morning, Martha. Great to be with you this morning. And, um, yeah, it is indeed an amazing day. So (laughs) this was kind of the unexpected candidate. This is a guy that most people hadn't heard of prior to the last few days. I mean, obviously, you worked with him. You knew him, Mm -hmm. but he wasn't a household name. Uh, And uh, you saw, just kind of walk us through what happened from the time Tom Emmer uh, pulled out of the race and then what led up to him getting the caucus united in a vote yesterday afternoon. Well, um, once Tom announced that he was pulling out of the race, then uh, we had, of course, another conference and uh, an opportunity for people to throw their names into the hat. And we had quite a few. Uh, We had um, uh, Mike Johnson. We had Byron Donalds. We had Mark Green, who was the chairman of um, Homeland. Uh, Then we had a uh, Chuck Fleischman, who was one of the um, uh, the members on appropriations. And and you know. Mike Johnson is the vice chair of our conference, so he's very well known across our conference. He's a very devout man. He's um, a a strong man of faith, a family man. He is a constitutional scholar. Uh, His job, actually, prior to coming to Congress, was that as as an attorney who defended the Constitution for Alliance Defending Freedom. So, you know, this is a very conservative man. And so, uh, so we united around him, in uh, um, thinking that he would have the best choice of those. You know, once the once the leadership chain was kind of done for, um, then Mike became the candidate of choice that could unite our party. Uh, and there really wasn't anything that anybody could say bad about him because there's nothing bad about Mike Johnson. <laughs> So I I loved I loved what he said I loved what he said in his speech about what his priorities were and even Hakeem Jeffries you know was gracious all while his you know his staff was tweeting untrue things about Mike Johnson Um, Hakeem Jeffries was gracious all the Republican leadership on the steps of the Capitol were gracious Uh, so what was it like yesterday afternoon. Uh, once they got to work, and then what's the day going to be like today? <clears throat> well, yesterday we fulfilled a promise. Uh, Mike Johnson said that we would get right to work, and the first thing we did was we passed the uh, resolution in support of Israel and condemning Hamas for their um, unconscionable violent terrorist attack against Israel, uh, against its civilians, and then Immediately, we went into the energy and, and water appropriation. And I'll tell you, Martha, that's the appropriation that has my amendment in it that eliminates the ability uh, of the Army Corps of Engineers to rename Lake Lanier and Buford Dam. So it's very important um, amendment and a very important uh, appropriation bill to me and, and to our district. Uh, I think it's going to pass, um, and I'm looking forward to seeing it on the House floor and, and voting for it today. So where are we on that? Because we had Mike Collins on yesterday, and he said that if we had been moving through the process without the speaker fight, we could be 90% done on the appropriations bills. And, of course, shoulda, coulda, woulda, doesn't get you anywhere. But now that we're back to work 
and we've got this deadline on November 17th. What is the likelihood that we can get the rest of the appropriations bills through and then possibly have, you know, a real thing to talk about before this November 17th deadline? Oh, we will definitely get our appropriations done. All right. I don't know that it will be by November the 17th. That's certainly our goal. We're going right back into session next week. It was supposed to be a district work week next week, but that's not going to happen. We're coming back, and we're going to work on more appropriations next week and the week after. Uh, I don't know that we will actually get all of them completed before the 17th when a new funding resolution will have to be uh, approved. But I will tell you that we'll do the very best we possibly can to make sure that happens. And I have been pushing. I started yesterday after uh, the speaker vote, uh, working with the Appropriations Committee to make sure that we have the timelines and um, we, you know, I help focus um, our effort to ensure that these appropriation bills uh, indeed got a vote on the House floor. Andrew, how you doing? This is Rod Huey. Good to hear, hear your voice again. Well, thank you, Rod. Hey, uh, this seems like a great ta- opportunity to get a budget, maybe get a budget, work on the budget stuff and try to get as much uh, of a budget passed, as well as having new blood to kind of make some some radical moves. What do you think? Well, I'll tell you that um, uh, the budget process occurs before the appropriations process. And um, I think your point of having, you know, of, of starting to work on the budget for next fiscal year is absolutely right on target. Uh, and that's one of the things that Speaker Johnson is focused on. You know, normally we wait for the president to prevent, present his budget first. We're not going to do that, I don't think, in 2025. Um, we are going to bring the House budget forward. The president's budget was a month late. Okay. And that put us, uh, you know, a month farther down the road toward the September 30th. I think uh, this coming January, we will be working on the budget and the appropriations process. And I know Speaker uh, Johnson's focus is to get those appropriations done before we leave in August. So we don't have this issue again. And I think that's that's his commitment to us. So two more questions, Andrew. Um, Are you open to doing another continuing resolution? Because that may be what we have to do to be able to get where you want to go? Well, um, number one, it depends what it looks like. You know, um, if it's a continuing resolution that is just, you know, that that doesn't have any uh, policy changes to it or that doesn't have any cuts to spending, uh, probably not. Okay. But um, uh, if if it was something like what uh, uh, Byron Donalds and the crew um, both from Freedom Caucus and from um, Main Street Caucus, you know, the more moderates in our in our Republican Party put together uh, the end of September. I, I voted for that. Right. You know, so right. Um, that that was critical to me to cut spending. And if we can do that, then I'm all for it. And when you actually, you know, short of 21 votes, were able to get that through. And that was a, a the most conservative proposal that's been put forward in a while. I'm looking forward to more conservative proposals, but that was the most conservative. You mentioned policy, and there was this chorus among Democrats yesterday uh, that the border policy doesn't need to be changed. Just more money uh, needs to be put forward. And that came from Chuck Schumer. It came from a number of your colleagues in the House. So border seems to be on the top of the list of the new speaker. What are you hearing about that? Well, throwing more money at the problem is typically what Congress has done in times past. And then they say, oh, we fixed it. We just threw more money at it. That is the wrong way to do it. You know, this administration has proven time and time again that they will ignore Um, you know, the law that they will ignore what we tell them and they will take the money and they'll do whatever they want with it. That cannot be allowed to happen again. H.R. 2 is a phenomenal border bill. I believe that bill will be added to whatever leverage we can um, use over the Senate. And I think that that bill uh, will be a great policy shift for us. Uh, Could be added to the next funding resolution, just like the last one that I voted for at the end of September. You know, if that same resolution came forward now with different leadership, I think you'd see a different result. Absolutely. Andrew Clyde, thank you so much for being with us today, and we look forward to y'all's hard work next week. 
Thanks, Martha. Always great to be on with you. Putting the talk in news talk. It's the Martha Zoller Show on AM 550 and FM 102.9 WDUN. Bill Crane is with me right now for Crane's Corner. And, you know, Bill, this is, again, I keep saying you don't want to say historical momentous, you know, all the things because we've never been through this before. And, and you know, you don't want to keep repeating that. But we've got now Mark Meadows is going to testify against Trump. you got Jenna Ellis is going to testify against Trump. You had Sidney Powell, who was just an icon of uh, the the people that were did not believe the 2020 election or believe the 2020 election was stolen. And, you know, some people say, well, they had to do it or they'd never be able to work again. But um, these are people that at the end of the day were lawyers and understood what the law was in many cases. If you read Sidney Powell's letter of apology to the people of Georgia, um, either she has had a change of heart or going forward, if you were considering having her represent you, there is no moral compass there. So I'm, I'm not sure which is the case. But the dominoes, if you will, I mean, Mark Meadows was quietly testifying yesterday as well. Um, there's a mountain of people in the president's inner circle on White House staff, off White House staff, on campaign staff, legal advisors that are, you know, essentially flipping, if you will, to the prosecution side. And I just, I do not see how President Trump or the remaining, I think it's now 14, indicted co-conspirators don't end up with one, at least one, RICO felony conviction. And the way RICO statutes work, federal and state, is if you convict one of the co-defendants on one of the charges that the other co-defendants are charged with, all of those co-defendants are guilty. You may remember the city of Atlanta cheating scandal, and that's how that case, which started out taking so long, became rapidly closing, because once those early RICO guilt findings came on those first jury trials, the convictions for other members were automatic, and then they started pleading. So... Um, I, I've said all along, and this is not gloating, and this is not about uh, taking shots at the former president. I do not see a path to escaping at least one felony conviction in these proceedings for the former president. So, talking a little bit about D.C., shifting gears, um, I had Mike Collins on earlier this morning, and Mike is carving out himself a very interesting place in that he is certainly a very conservative MAGA Republican and has is supports the president, all of that kind of stuff. But he has a sense of humor. He's very much like I've enjoyed his, his Twitter feed yes, or his ex feed. Yes, he has a sense of humor. He's very much like his father that he believes you have to be liked and trusted to be able to get anything done. Uh, and he voted to keep Kevin McCarthy in because he didn't think it was the right time to make that kind of change. He's pragmatic about where you are. And I think he's carving out a really interesting spot when I think a lot of people discounted him as just being a right-wing nut initially. His father certainly wasn't, and I knew Congressman Matt Collins pretty yes. well. I've only yes. met Congressman Mike Collins once very briefly, so I'm going to be careful in how I form my opinions. But I have enjoyed his kind of insider seat with me looking at the outside of this circus that is the House GOP attempting to select a caucus leader and speaker when they continue to seem to want to assassinate each other. I don't I mean, it, it, it's almost daily that we read someone new is entering the race and someone who is gaining some momentum is exiting the race and watching AOC gloat really on the nightly other side for a uh, newscast. Well, and he made the point today, remaining. if had we left Kevin McCarthy in by now, based on the calendar, Almost all the appropriations bills would have been done, and we would have easily been able to make this deadline of November 17th and actually have the budget passed, which he is. Well, he's right. He's, he yeah. is right. I mean, the majority of uh, it tends to get forgotten, but all but eight Republicans sort of thought the way he did, whether they liked or loathed Kevin McCarthy. They voted to keep him as speaker, and now we're dealing with the aftermath of a handful led by Matt Goetz uh, starting that insurrection. Sorry to use that word again. Uh, to oust the speaker in the middle of a Congress where there were multiple looming deadlines. Now, admittedly, it did occur before Hamas attacked Israel, but everything else they're dealing with up there and as a country that we've been dealing with is not new. And time is of the essence. And it's, you know, it's watching Nero fiddle while Rome, while Rome burns. I just, it, I, 
I don't see how the GOP recovers from this fully before the 2024 cycle in terms of Congress and elections for which House and which party should be a majority in the U.S. House. And it also you mentioned um, Israel and Hamas, and and you're you live in Atlanta, so you know you've seen, I'm sure, some of the things that have been happening there. It is shocking to me how quick we've gone from clearly an inv- an unprovoked invasion of civilian space and the murder of people. And yesterday, Israel had to go as far as it because in less than three weeks, people have started to say it didn't happen. And so Israel had to release uh, unedited Go GoPro cam uh, video from uh, from, from the carnage the, from the, of the carnage for journalists to look at, so there could be additional uh, sources. And one reporter who's been covered the whole thing, he said, "It's not enough for me to interview an eyewitness. What I'm being told is." That that's not good enough. They want to see the video. And that's a part of this crazy social media world that we live in. And I am just shocked at how quickly it's changed. And I'm also shocked at the level of anti-Semitism that there really is in this country. And uh, I, I'm, I'm sad about it. The city of Brookhaven is a client of mine. And then over the weekend, um, and the city of Brookhaven is no liberal bastion, but over the weekend... Churches and public spaces all across the city were flyered with anti-Semitic leaflets in 2023. I mean, things saying like the Holocaust didn't happen. Now, I I started to see there was going to be a problem domestically when I see college students, not just in the Ivy League, but a small group at Emory University, which has a significant Jewish population within its student body, protesting in favor of Hamas. Um. Uh, I don't know where this comes from, if it's that we don't teach history correctly anymore or we don't teach history at all. But I have some college-age students and recent graduate children who are friends of family, and they're protesting in favor of the people of the Palestine and Gaza. I, I don't understand it. There are a few nations in the world or a few people that have been as loyal as long to the United States as the people of Israel, and it well predates World War II, when the nation of Israel was created by well, column so on access to again, UN.com this week, speaks to that. And again, Palestine, Palestinians are different than what we're talking about with Hamas. And I have great sympathy for Palestinians. Okay, but if they don't understand that Hamas does not care how many Palestinians die as long as they get to kill more Jews. And that is a fact that can be backed up by how they have treated the Palestinians. If they were out there saying free Palestine, I'd be fine. But there are groups that are saying gas the Jews, kill the Jews. And that's just that's just wrong. And, um, you know, you've seen people like Robert Kraft has put a lot of money behind this, uh, stand behind hate of, uh, for Israel uh, or stand against hate for Israel. Um, you've started to see Jewish donors of these universities pull their money out. I mean, it's it's a very interesting uh, and sad time. And you know, we have not only Congress locked up, but there's limits to what the White House can do without a Congress in place to spend or make allocations relative to our weapon systems, not things that are not already over there. You know, again, we've got a longstanding relationship, but they're at war whether we want to see it that way or not. The people of Israel, the nation of Israel are at war, and this could potentially spread into Lebanon as well as the West Strip, the west side of the Gaza Strip. Well, and I I, I hope that we're not trying to overmanage it because, you know, if if you're going to go to war, and it's not always the right thing to go to war, but if you go to war, your goal ought to be to make the other side surrender, not to make the other side feel like they've gotten proportional damage for what they did for you. That's uh, that's what happens when you get academics involved, with all due respect. Anyway, Bill's column is up, and, and uh, of course, we're so happy to always have him on Access WDUN, and we look forward to talking with you again next week, Bill. Thank you. Take care. To hear the full versions of last week's Martha Zoller shows, go to the podcast page at accesswdun.com and you can follow me on social media at Martha Zoller.